So this morning, though, we're going to be going to the last uh, chapter of the book of Joshua and finish off our, our study in Joshua. And it's, um, uh, it's the whole concept of service, of, of being willing to serve God, being willing to do what He's called upon us to do. And in this passage of Scripture, we read a portion of it, and we get that impression that, that there's the challenge to the people of Israel to decide who they're really going to serve and, and to make that decision and, and to see if they can follow through with that decision. And um, I believe every week, every day, God challenges each and every one of us that are here to decide whether or not we're going to serve Him, to follow Him, to go where He calls us to go. And it's a challenge that most of us um, struggle with. I know this last week, we, uh, during the National Baptist Convention in Calgary when I was there, we had commissioned a, a missionary couple. And uh, it was an interesting story. The, the girl, the, the, the mom or the wife and the wife, there's three children that are going as well, um, is, uh, comes out of a, a Muslim background, or actually Orthodox Christian background, and uh, out of the Middle East, and uh, a place where women are not necessarily treated as equals, as we know if you look at Saudi Arabia and places like that. In Saudi Arabia, women still can't drive. And um, some might say that's probably a blessing, but, but I would say that, you know, that's just, this just shows you the inequalities that are, still exist. And she shared her testimony of how she came to Canada to escape that kind of thinking, that kind of oppression in her life. And now what, what has happened in her life, God has called her and her husband and her children back to the area. We don't know the exact country because it will be considered a black flag country, so a country that we don't broadcast where they are. Um, our convention is sending her and her husband and her children back to where she said she'd never want to go. But God has challenged her and her husband to be faithful. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to follow? Who are you going to listen to? And uh, it, was, it, was, it was really interesting. We also got to meet a couple that if you go to the back table... And on, you'll see where the missionary cards are, and there's a couple called G and T. Can't give you their names, can't tell you where they've gone, you can't take pictures of them, they can't talk about missions and, or any of those things. And they shared, they're on furlough this, this rate at this time, they're actually going to be at our, our associational meeting this year, and uh, they shared about their work there as well. Where it's dangerous, very dangerous to be able to, to share their, um, their faith, to be able to, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Now they're able to do the things that they're, that, uh, of good works, they're able to do those kinds of things. But G and T, uh, G is, is a, a phys ed um, background and, uh, and has been doing lots of great things with, with the children in the area and able to do that. But he desires to do one thing and that is to, to be able to proclaim the gospel. Now they have three children as well. Two of them are now at the University of Manitoba and uh, the one that is 15, he's actually home. He'll be at SYC this summer but uh, as well next week. But, but it's a challenge for them and it's scary for them. The wife is a, is a nurse and she has done lots of clinics for, for women and trying to help women. And again, it's a struggle because they, they, they know that it's, there's a danger. And they, in their testimony, said, do we do what is just good works or we do what makes a difference in the people's lives? Do we need to start sharing the gospel? And they're, they're willing to, uh, to, to basically give up it all in order to make a difference in people's lives. God's called them to an area in the Middle East, North Africa in the Middle East, and they, again, are another couple that, that uh, said yes to God. I will we'll follow you. We'll do what you called us to do. Now, in this passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua gives them a recount uh, of what God has done for them. And what God has done for you should compel you to be able to say, I can do that. This, this young lady, well, young mother, who's willing to take her three children, one is very tiny, one is maybe about four or five years old, and then they go up to, looks like about 10 or 11 years old, are willing to go back into this country because of what God has done for her, for her in her life. 
In fact, for her, she recounted for about 10, 15 minutes her story of how her brothers were mean to her and how, how her life was just, how horrible her life was and how daily she was in tears. And by the end of her testimony, she was in tears, not tears of sadness, but tears of joy because she was able to recount for us what God had done for her. In verses 1 through 13 of this chapter of, of, of Joshua, Joshua recounts for the people all that God had done for them, how He had taken them out of the land of Egypt, how He had moved through them and, 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 and it was, it helped them cross over the Jordan River and to take the land and to, to um, be able to take the promised land where God had promised they, would, they could reside. It's so important when we think that God is asking of us something hard for us to do and difficult for us to do, that we are, are sure of our, of our history, of our, our past, to know that God has done so much for us. And what has God done for you? Well, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, we read this. It says, We must therefore pay even more attention to what we have heard so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through the angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received was, was just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distribution of, the, of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to His will. For he has not subjected the angels to the to the the angels the world to come that we are talking about, but one has somewhere test, has set, testified. What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For if subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering in death. For in bringing many sons to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God all things exist for him and through him should make the source of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. See, what this passage of Scripture basically comes out and proclaims to us is that God, through his Son, Jesus Christ, made it possible for us to receive salvation. Through His Son, Jesus Christ made it possible for us to have the forgiveness of sins. Through His Son, Jesus Christ made it possible for us to live with the freedom that He intended for us to live with. The freedom to, to experience all God's creation. You see, it's important for us to understand that when we look at our lives, and we look at the challenges that are presented to us, and we look at what God is calling each and every one of us to, and that is to reach out to a lost and dying world. When we look at what He has done in our lives, it should compel us and, 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 and direct us to be willing to go and do as He has called us to do, just as G&T did, just as this other couple has, that, that, and so many others that are willing to go and do just as God has called them to do, regardless of what, what it might be. And in this case here, in the people of Israel, Joshua recounts for them and says, look at what God has done for us. Look at the mighty things He has done, the, the miracles that He has performed, and the great things that He's done for us in order for us to be able to have a place we call home. To live in cities that are not, we did not build ourselves. To, live, to, to work in the fields that we did not cultivate ourselves. And you know that what he's basically saying is, what he's leading up to is that now if you consider all these things, what are you to do? 
What is your strength for service? What is, what is your ability? Why do, you, why do you desire to do the things you do? Why does, does the, the worship team stand before you to, to proclaim uh, worship for you? To help you to initiate that, that desire to sing? Well, knowing those that have stand up before you today, I know that each and every one of them is because of what God has done in their lives. Knowing Joyce's heart, and I know I never asked Joyce permission to say anything about her, I know Joyce's heart. And her desire for you in, in worship is not to pay attention to what she's doing up there, but to direct your hearts to God. Joshua is coming to the people. And now he's going to change gears a little bit. He's telling them what, he's, what they've done, what, what God has done in their lives. Now the challenge comes is choose who you'll serve. In verse 14 through 15, we read in that passage of Scripture that Joshua says, now you know you, there's the gods here and there's the, uh, of the people, there's the gods that our fathers have served. Now you need to choose for yourself who you're going to serve. Can you put up that the passage, that passage up there right now? Yeah. It says, therefore, fear the Lord and worship Him in sincerity. Now, in some older passages of Scripture, it would say, in older translations, it would say, choose for yourself who you're going to serve. And, or, and serve, the Lord, serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods of your, ance your ancestors' worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. And worship the Lord and serve the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to serve the Lord or worship the Lord, choose for yourself today the one you'll serve. The gods of your, father, your, your father's worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in, in, the, in whose land you are now living. But here's the key. Here's the example he wants to be. As for me and my house, as for me and my family, who we, we will serve the Lord. Joshua challenges the people to make a choice. But for his family, it's obvious. It's the same for us. We must choose. You know, you can't just go along your merry way and just ignore the truth. You can't go and just receive salvation and it never change your life. You see, Joshua is saying to the people, you know, God has done all these things for you. God has done all these amazing things in your lives. He has saved you. He has saved our people. He has saved our nation. He has saved us. He saved your families. Now, because God has saved you, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to serve Him or are you going to just go about your life just as, it, as it's always been? And for us, the question's the same, basically. God has come into your life. He has changed your life. He has given you new life. He's given you eternal life, everlasting life. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And for you that have believed in Jesus Christ, He's given you everlasting life. Now the question is, who will you serve? He's done this for you. Are you going to just take it for granted? Or are you going to say yes to the Lord and say, I'll follow you no matter where you call me to go. I'll, do as you, where, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll serve where you want me to serve. I'll be who you want me to be. There's a great old hymn that says those words. I'll go where you want me to go, Lord Jesus. I'll be what you want me to be. God has done so much in our lives. God blesses us. God works in our lives. He's, he's done so much in our families. That you think about some of your families where, where, your, where your parents have come to faith in Christ. And now you yourselves have come to faith in Christ. Can you just go along your day, day just as, as, as always? What I would say in this passage of Scripture, are you going to, for us, we could reinterpret it and say, are you going to serve the, the society, society as it is? Or are you, are you going to follow after their gods, the gods of culture? And you know there's many of those things. We don't, you know, we don't have graven images per se like they, they, they would in this time, like the Amorites did. But you think about our society. What are the gods of our society? Houses, cars, money, whatever you might want to say. Fame. 
And you know, I'm not saying having a house is a bad thing. I'm excited about us getting to have a house. I'm, it's not bad to have a car. We, Ardell and I both have a car. I'm not saying it's bad to have money and it's, and it's good to save money and, and to have money in order to, we, you know, we're trying to work towards having something for if we ever retire. I don't know if we'll ever retire. I'll be like my dad. I'll probably work until I, until, until I drop dead at least. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But you know, I'm not telling you that those are bad things, but those are not the priority. Those are not the pinnacle. Those are not the be-all, end-all. Those are not everything in your, for your lives. Your career is not everything. Your, all those things are not everything. What needs to become the priority and the thing that's important is, who will you serve? Will you serve the God of your salvation or the gods of the world? And as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And it feels like sometimes for Ardell and I, our house is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We only have one left at home. But, but as for, uh, you know, for, uh, for us, that's the, that's the priority. Her and I have both taken this survey and I peaked, I, she got mad at me because I was, we're supposed to take this survey by ourselves and it's a marriage enrichment and looks at, looks at our, our married life and, and, tr- and sort of, and then we'll, we'll sit down with a counselor and, and look at our, at our, uh, how we, we come out. Hopefully it'll tell us that we should be married for, since we've been married for 27 years already, but it may tell us we have some things that we need to work on, but that's okay. But it helps us to know where our hearts are. And I peeked at hers a little bit here and there. She, she uh, caught me doing that a couple times. And, and we both have, I found it interesting, the one key that is that, is that on the priority is it had strongly disagree, disagree, undecided, agree, and strongly agree. And it was the question of our faith and the importance of our faith in our family. And we both said the, that it's a high priority. So as for us, we want to serve the Lord. That's our key. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said this, no, house, household can sla- can, no household slave can be the slave to two masters, since he either will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You, cannot, you can't be a slave to both God and money, it says here. We all try to do this, but it's not, it's not possible. We become very weak in both, or, but more important, we fail to be devoted to our, devote ourselves to God. Now we can put into there, I believe we can say where it says you can't be a slave both to God and money. You put in there whatever you want to say. Money, money might not be an issue to you. Because for, for me, if you don't have money, it can't be an issue, right? If you don't have it, you can, it's not a problem. But, you, but maybe it's another thing. Maybe it's fashion. Maybe it's more shoes. Maybe it's more something else. Oh, my daughters both just gave me the look about shoes. Because they have lots of shoes, the two of them. But, the, you know, it, whatever it is that becomes between you and your God, become, between you and, and serving God, it needs to be removed. It needs to be dropped down to a different, to a different level. Because we can't let our service to God take a second seat To other things. Which brings me to the last point that I want to share with you this morning. It comes from verse 26 and 20 through 28 of uh, Joshua 24, and that's whatever it takes. You know, they come, you go through this passage of Scripture, if you read the whole passage, the people come out and they proclaim, we'll serve God, we'll, we'll serve Him. And I get the impression what we find there is that it's a, a whatever it takes kind of attitude. Joshua had a whatever it takes. He knew that they, they needed to remember the commitment they made to God. We need to not let anything get in the way of us moving forward and following Him. You know, and I'd be even willing to say that sometimes we can't let school do that. This week, Again, the guy from Golden Gate was there and talking about doctoral programs and he sat down with me and talked with me for a little while and I thought, I thought, well, this sounds interesting again. But then I thought, that can't get in the way of what God wants me to do. You know, and, there, and there's other things like that. We can't let the, be driven by the things the world sees as important. You want to do well. You want to bring honor to God. You want to do, do what's right. But let's remember, whatever God t- calls us to, we need to have that whatever it takes attitude.
Remember that uh, we need to remember that God, that all that God has done for us, and we need to decide where we're going to focus our lives. It's not just enough to say that we are Christians. It's not just enough to just to go to church. It's not just enough to be a consumer Christian. It's not just enough just to hope our friends and families come to faith in Christ. It's not enough just to be a marginal Christian. You see, we can't just sit on the sidelines. We can't be strapped to the pew. We can't be strapped to our, our fears. I don't know about you, and many of you I've shared this with probably a number of times, but it might surprise you that I see myself as fairly introvert. And uh, in other words, an extrovert person is what? A person that is willing to stand up and be the center of attention. Now, that's not my, not my, my uh, way I like to do things. If I could, I'd rather have someone else be the, be the focus. So as an introvert, I like to just sort of, you know, I, Ardell wasn't with me this week. And when my wife is not with me, when I go down to, to things like a convention, I feel a little like a little lost sheep. It's like I don't know what to do with myself. See, Ardell will go and she'll come right over to someone and say, so how are you doing, Alexander? And me, and I'll just, I'll just follow along and I'll go, hello, Alexander, how are you doing too? And it's, so I have, to wait, uh, I have to wait for her too, right? And, and it's sort of a scary kind of thing for me and I, it's intimidating. But it's, it's something that, that God, has, God helps me to do, and it has to be whatever it takes. So, so as I go through, and, I, and I have, if it means that I have to straddle over these pews to get to somebody to help them, that's what God, that's whatever it takes. We can't be willing to just sort of sit back and say, oh, there's way too many barriers. I can't go through with this. I can't do it. For me, it's, it was school. God had called me to the ministry and my dad said to me that if you want to be in the ministry, you need to go to school. Now, that's coming from a man who never went to school. He just did a little bit of Bible college. Never finished a degree ever. He has, has no bachelor's degree, has no master's degree or any, kind of, any, any degree at all. He has the, the school that comes from life. Some would call him a lay pastor or lay preacher, but he actually, I would put him up against many other men who, who have doctorates because of his, his life experiences. But my dad said to me, if you want to go, you need to, you, need to, you need to just do it. When I was in grade nine, I'd already felt called to the ministry. At the age of 14, I, I really sensed through, during a revival service that God had called me into the ministry. And everybody went, whoa, that, that little shy boy can't do it. And that was the first big hurdle I had to get through. So I had to try to get past this big, big, big wall that everybody said that I couldn't do it. And then I got to grade 9 and my, in, my, in school, and I was, I was a terrible student. I'll be honest with you. I'm so pleased with my, with my kids that all of them did very well in school. But when I got to school... And when I was in school, it was always a struggle. It was always hard. Math, to me, is just like this big mystery. I, it, it's like this, 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 it may as well be, um, you know, I don't know. It, 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 it just may as well be like climbing the top of Mount Everest for me to, get, to understand math. And I got to grade 9, and I was failing school. And the, the guidance counselor came to me and about four other boys, and they, she said to us, you guys can't do this stuff. You're not, a, you're not smart enough for school, basically. That's not exactly the words she said. That's the words I heard from her. She said, basically, you're not bright enough, you're not smart enough. And I, and I went, well, great. So she said, you know, and at that time, Vic or JP, not JT, W. Wagner were, were two trades type high schools at the time. So you could go and you could take and start working on a trade. And they said, you might want to think about going in that route. And I said, well, that's not really what I think I want to do. I, I want to go to school. Go to school. And uh, she said, well, I think you need to bring your parents in. My dad came in and said to the guidance counselor at that time, she said, at that time they just didn't go to the grade 10. I wouldn't go to grade 10. If I failed, I failed, right? At that time we didn't get to a free pass. And today, you know, you, kids go through school fast and regardless of, uh, of what, they, what they, their abilities are. That's my opinion. Anyways, um, my dad went into the guidance counselor and she sa he says to her, he says, uh, that's, not good, that's not what he wants to do in his life. She goes, well, he's not ready for that. He's not really ready for it. And he said, well, basically, I'll tell you this. If he takes 10 years to get through grade 9, he's going to stay there in grade 9 and get, to, get through it until he figures it out. Because that's, what, that's not what, what God's called him to do. Luckily enough, <laughs> 
I pulled my sock up on my socks and I got to work. And I got to manage to get through grade nine. Grade 10, 11, and 12 were not much easier. Now the difference is that my parents were convinced that 50s were good for me. And uh, so, my, so I was able to get through grade 10, 11, and 12 with that average of about 50 to 60, you know. And I played football, I played rugby, did all these things. And I wasn't, and it came time for me to go to, to university and I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this because, you know, what university is going to take you in when they want your averages to be 70, 75. And I said, well, we'll see what happens. Well, I'll, coming out of high school, I got married, right? You, most of you realize that, so that's why this summer we'll be married 27 years and I graduated from high school 27 years ago. And uh, it was interesting. I was short a few credits, so I went back. I had to go back to high school. I went back to Ross Shepherd, and I was actually a married student at the time. You can't do that now, of course. You'd have to go to Center High. And I went back to high school, and I took one class because I was a couple credits short. I failed uh, Biology 30, and I wasn't going to take Biology 30 again because I'm not going to. I'm not foolish enough to go do another departmental or what do you guys call them? What government exams that they call them now? I'm not sure what you know the performance exams. We had departmentals then. That was the first year. It was 50% of my grade. I failed. And so I had to go back. And I did that. And it was a whatever-it-takes type attitude that had to come out. And what I did was that I took that. And you know what is interesting? God opened the door for me to go to North American Baptist College and start college, even though I didn't finish high school. So I was going to college, and I was going to high school. Now, I did, not, did skip class a little bit here and there, at, uh, and I got a letter home when I was uh, in my second, sec, second half of the, of the semester that said to the parents and guardians of Dennis Mill, you know, you need to address this, this absence problem, and uh, Ardell sent a note back and said, I'll take care of it. And uh, so, my, you know, my wife had to send a note. No, she didn't have to send a note. But, but uh, we, I showed up and made sure I was there. I did get into college. It took me two years to figure out that college was really tough, and I, and I struggled. But it was whatever it takes, God. I know that you called me. I don't understand this. I can't figure it out. I'm not a great student. And I, so I took a couple years off. We had two children. Had Alexander and Andalina. And when Andalina was six weeks old, God opened the door for us to go to Oklahoma. And we moved to Oklahoma and lived in some different situations, you know, with bugs and so forth. And I shared that with you. And then we got to there, and I figured out that I needed to really do whatever God wanted me to do. And I said, Lord, you've got me this far. Here's my past. But now, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And it's whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. So that meant I studied, I worked hard, I got through it, and in fact, I finished college with about a 3.8 average on a four scale. And then I got to seminary and it was the same thing. I said, Lord, if whatever it takes, if this is what I need to do, I'm going to do what you called me to do. And God, through God, with God's help, I got through seminary as well with a, with a 3.65 average in seminary. And now, as I stand before you each Sunday, it's a whatever it takes attitude that really gets me here. Because I'm terrified every time. As I sit here, as I get ready to preach, and I know the time is coming, because I usually I know the order of the service from the worship leaders, my heart, I can almost feel my heart pumping out, out of my heart, out of my chest. It just goes boom, 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 boom. And until I stand up here, and then God gives me the opportunity to, to share with you what He's placed on my heart to share with you. Whatever it takes. Going out to the lost, going without going against what makes sense, going against the logic of the world. If, if the Holy Spirit says, go, I'll go. This week I met the new Miss Canada. She's this little thing about this tall. Her name is Tara. And Tara is a, a Baptist minister's daughter. She's from uh, British Columbia. She was Miss BC. Now she's Miss Canada as of January. We don't have it. It's not televised on TV. But Tara is just, you would, I wish you could meet her. And in fact, you're, you have the opportunity to meet her next month. Um, she's going to be sh here in Edmonton sh uh, to, to uh, speak uh, and, uh, about a topic that's on her heart, which I'll share with you. Tara feels called to work against the slave trade in the modern day slave trade. The selling of young girls into the sex trade. Tara's been to Malaysia. She's been now to uh, Vietnam. She's been to a whole bunch of little areas in, in uh, Southeast Asia. To be able to go into the brothels 
into these areas that, that uh, most of us would even be terrified to go into. She told of a story of watching a man in his 40s or 50s walking down the street holding the hand of about a 10 to 14 year old girl that had been so basically sold to him. But God has called her into that ministry. Ah, that's her. She's really, and that doesn't give her justice. She's a tiny little thing. Nathaniel, she's probably about your height. Oh, that didn't really go over all this. <laughs> but, but she's like, but, you know, this pretty little girl. And, and she says, she's a beautiful woman that, that has come to realize that God has something he's placed on her heart. And as she stood, and tears came to her eyes as she shared about these, these children. It was a whatever it takes attitude. That's what we need in our hearts today. So the question is who will you serve? Will you serve the gods of your parents, of your ancestors? Will you serve the gods of this world? Or you, will you serve the God who saves you?